Narayanam Namaskritya Natam Chaivana Rotamam Devim Sarasvatim Vyasam Tatu Jayam Mudirayat Nastapraya Subhadesu Nityu Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttamash Loke I read uh, some verses before this verse. I'm supposed to read from verse 13. Itya bi vya ritam tasya akanya sura punga baha aplamana vidas tasya tat tatit ya va mam sata. And that is, the chief of the demons were not very expert in deciding things. Upon hearing the sweet words of Mohini Moti, they immediately assented, yes, they answered. What you have said is all right. Thus the demons agreed to accept her decision. The demigods and the demons then observed a fast. After bathing, they offered clarified butter and oblations to the fire and gave charity to the cows, to the brahmanas, to the members of other orders of society, namely the kshatriyas, vaishas, and sudras who were all rewarded as they deserved thereafter. The demigods and demons performed ritualistic ceremonies under the directions of the brahmanas. They then dressed themselves as new garment according to their own choice, decorated their bodies with ornaments and set facing east on seats made of kusha grass. Next verse. O king, as the demigods and demons set facing east in an arena fully decorated with flower garlands and lamps, and fragment with the smoke of incense that woman dressed in a most beautiful sari her ankle bells tinkling entered the arena walking very slowly because of her big low hips her eyes were restless due to useful pride her breasts were like water jugs her thighs resembled the trunks of elephant and she carried a water pot in hand now we come to that verse yes Tamsri, okay. Tamsi Sakim Kanaka Kundala Charukarna Kanaka Pula Vandanam Para Devaktakyam Samviksya Samuhur Muhur Utsmita Viksna Sena Vasura Vigalita Stana Patikantam Tam unto her Sri Sakim appearing like a person associate of the goddess of fortune Kanaka Kundalam with golden earrings Charu very beautiful Karna Ears, Nasa, nose, Kapola, cheeks, Vadanam, face, Paradevata Akyam, Supreme Personality of Godhead, appearing in that form, Samsvikya, looking at her, Samuhu. All of them became enchanted. Utsmita, slightly smiling. Vikshanena, glancing over them. Devasuraha, all the demigods and demons. Vagali Tastana Patika Antam. The border of the sari on the breast moved slightly. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Her attractive nose and cheeks and her ears adorned with golden earrings made her face very beautiful. As she moved, her sari's border on the breast moved slightly aside. And the demigods and the demons saw these beautiful features of Mohanimoti, Mohinimoti, who was glancing at them and slightly smiling. They were all completely enchanted. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. 
Shri Vishwanath Chakravati remarks here that Mohini Murti is a supreme personality of Godhead in a feminine form and that the goddess of fortune is her associate. This form, assumed by the personality of Godhead, challenged the goddess of fortune. The goddess of fortune is most beautiful, but if the Lord accepts the form of a woman, he surpasses the goddess of fortune and beauty. It is not that the goddess of fortune, being female, is the most beautiful. The Lord is so beautiful that he can excel any beautiful goddess of fortune by assuming a female form. Sri Chaitanya Manu Vishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Svayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svaparatikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Uta Parakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Sa Sri Rupam Sagadratan Sahagana Rauna Tanvitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Svaduta Pajana Saitam Krishna Chaitana Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Vishri Ramacha Sajjata He Krishna Karna Sindhu Dina Bandhura Pati Gopisha Gopisha Kanta Adha Kanta Namasuti Tapta Kanchana Gurangi Radhe Vinayasya Shradi Vrishabhana Sutti Devi Pranamaya Vanishakal Patru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Veva Cha Paritana Pavnevi Vaishnavi Vidamnoha Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare So, it is uh, a fact revealed by Brahma that uh, in Brahma Samhita that Advaita Machutim Anadim Ananta Rupam that he uh, manifests unlimited forms. And in another verse, Brahmaji also says, Premanjana Churi Te Bhakti Ruchanena Santak Sadeva Adira Yeshu Vilyoti Yam Shama Sundaram Achintya Guna Swarupam That's the form of God is inconceivable. That's another verse where the form of God is addressed. That he has unlimited forms and these forms are inconceivable. I mean, who would have thought that uh, Krishna appears in the form of a woman? I mean, what Muslim can accept that Allah comes in the form of a woman? That's inconceivable. Or even that Allah has form. Even that is inconceivable to many people. Many people think that uh, the, uh, the Lord, when he takes a material form, no, when he takes a form, that this form is material. That he, it is Brahma Sarup, the manifestation of Brahma. <clears throat> but we know from Lord Brahma again, that Ishvara Sarva Paramakrishna, the Supreme Lord, is Krishna and that his body is Satchit Ananda Vigraha. His body is full of bliss, full of knowledge and it is eternal. So Krishna can assume any form he likes. In fact, we all know from scripture there's Swamsa and Vibhinamsa that he, uh, the, all these unlimited forms of God that are emanating from himself, the first category are the Swamsa and these are the different manifestations of forms and avatars <coughs> in coming into this material world. The avatars of Krishna, they are all Swamsa. And uh, uh, those Purusha avatars, as there is uh, Karana Dakashaya Vishnu, Garu Dakashaya Vishnu, and uh, uh, Kshiru Dakashaya Vishnu, or Super Soul in Everyone's Heart, they are also uh, Swamsa, the expansions of Krishna. But he is uh, Krishna's Stu Bhagavan Swayam, as it says in Bhagavatam, he is the cause of all causes. He is the cause of all these. There are so many incarnations, as Srila Vyasadeva says, of forms of God, but uh, he is the supreme form, the supreme personality of God. Of course, in the material world, nobody knows, and Krishna is quite outspoken about it in Bhagavad Gita, in this uh, classical verse where he says, uh, what just is going on here? Naham prakasha savasya yoga maya samavitaha mudoriyam namijana ti lokuma machamave. Naham prakasha savasya yoga maya samavitaha. I am always hidden by my yoga maya energy to mudas. Mudas can, fools cannot see me. So if, anybody, if anybody can say 
uh, or is honestly saying, I cannot see God, that means he's a fool. And so we are also foolish, but uh, we are seeing Krishna's form on the altar. So we have enough intelligence to come to the Hare Krishna movement where we can actually see Krishna's form on the altar. And uh, uh, we come to the Hare Krishna, we have the intelligence that we came to the Hare Krishna movement because in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains himself. I mean, if you look at, uh, at uh, uh, Abrahamic religion, Abrahamic, they're all based on Abraham, means Christian and Jewish and Muslim religion. There's not much revelation about God. Even Moses, when he came uh, uh, in front of a burning bush in the desert, that burning bush, you can, the descendants of this burning bush you can still see in St. Catherine Monastery in Sinai. We went there a couple of years ago. It's a very amazing high monastery and there's this original burning bush, at least descendants, descendant of descendant of descendant, etc. It's a long time ago. So when he came to this bush, born a burning bush in the desert, which is highly unusual, a voice came and said, fall on your face. This is sacred ground. So he immediately paid his dandavat, he fell on his face. And then the, he asked this question, he said, Lord, who are you? And the answer is, I am what I am. Which is not much of an answer, if you think about it. If you, in practical terms, if I ask Maharaj, you know, what is your name? He says, I am what I am. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you, this is not much information. But Krishna, when he, uh, he, I'm the source of everything, the whole creation rests upon me, the wise who know this, worship me with all their heart. He gives so many informations about himself. There's no truth beyond me, all universes are resting on me like pearls are strung on a thread. With a single fragment of myself, I maintain and support the whole universe. I mean, there's unlimited information about Krishna given by himself in Bhagavad Gita, more information, hundreds of verses in Uddhava Gita. And of course, Bhagavatam, 10th Kanto, Krishna talks about himself. There's so much, and the Acharyas, they elaborated so much about Krishna. But in generally, Mohitam uh, Namijana Timam Ebiya Param Avyayam, that the whole world does not know me, who am above the most and inexhaustible. There's another verse where Krishna says, this is Vedaham, that I know Bhutani, I know all living beings. However, Mam tu Vedana Kashana, but me no one knows. Me no one knows. That's a fact. So, Queen uh, Kunti, she similarly explained the famous verse Prabhupada quotes all the time Maya Javani Kacham, the Javani Kakacham, Janavi Kachanam, Ad Hok Sajam, Avyayam, Nalakshya Simura Drisha, Natu, Nat Yadaru, Yataha. Being beyond the limited sense perception, you are the eternal, irreproachable factor covered by my, the curtain of deluding energy. You are invisible to the foolish observer exactly as an actor dressed as a prayer is not recognized. So the absolute truth is not subject to our understanding of imperfect century endeavors. He's not subject, he's subject to direct experience. And uh, so our understanding of Krishna, by the end of the day, is based on revelation, Shastra. She has Shastra Vidimutsita, one who does not accept Shastra, when he's lost. Whatever he does is a failure. But uh, 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 Krishna reveals himself to his devotees. You know, uh, because you're my friend, Krishna says to Arjuna, I'm giving you this most intimate knowledge. Or he says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhaktiya Tvanyanyaya Sakya, that only by undivided devotion can I be understood as I am. This is how we know Krishna. And of course, Brahma Samhita, he says that uh, famous verse, Pramanjana Churita Bhakti Vilochanena, Santaksa Deva Dida Yeshu Vilokayanti, Yam Shama Sundram Achinta Guna Swarupam Govinda Madipursham Tamaham Bajami. I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Shama Sundra Krishna himself, with inconceivable, innumerable attributes. Now it comes the point, whom the pure devotees see in the heart of hearts with the eye 
of devotion tinged with the salt of love. So unless there is love of Krishna, we cannot understand Krishna. And in the Western world, even in Western religiosity, I mean, I'm raised a Christian, and uh, the, 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 the top understanding or top desire of Christians in general is to become free from sin. They're praying that Jesus died for our sin. I mean, if you talk to a Christian, you will immediately say, but Jesus died for our sins. Now, uh, liberation from sin is not the highest. Now, it's, uh, there are many verses in Bhagavatam that said, even if somebody chants just one time sincerely the name of God, all sins are forgiven. Remember Arjamil. He just uttered at the time of death, he became qualified. So forgiveness of the sin is not a great issue. They think it is the biggest issue. Why? Because that's all they want. They just want to be absolved from their sins and then go to the spiritual world without improvement. Without improvement. And the whole world, whole spiritual world would be filled up with fools and rascals. I mean, Krishna sends us out in the first place into the material world because of the subtle aversion towards Krishna. Like Bhakti Siddhanta has said that the living entity has become some or other, we don't know how, averse to Krishna in the spiritual world. And so there's an aversion there. You know, that uh, towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, uh, to be free from sin, which is sported or paraded as the top achievement of religiosity, is not. And people abuse this very much. Well, I can sin because Jesus died for my sins. Or, as a, the worst thing I've ever seen in this connection was a post, a huge banner, in the American uh, Burning Man Festival two years ago. And it says, unless we sin, Jesus died for nothing. I mean, that's the worst. I mean, we have to sin, in other words. If you don't sin yet, you must sin, otherwise Jesus died for nothing. It's, uh, you cannot drive it higher. The ignorance, the arrogance, and the offensiveness. And you say, well, I, you have to sin. Unless we sin, Jesus died for nothing. There's nothing, it's inconceivable to my brain that somebody even would put this into writing. So, to achieve love of God, Krishna doesn't give love of God very, not very easily. Forgiveness of sin you can get very easily. Sometimes devotees are so worried about their past karma. But that can give Krishna by, just by chanting the holy name, gradually, gradually, gradually. All sins are forgiven. If you turn to Krishna, Sarva, Raman, Pejjadya, there you have it. But the difficult thing is to achieve love of God. And uh, uh, for that there's a whole process that brings us from initial faith to revelation. Because that's what it's all about, that the absolute truth reveals itself. I mean, we can look at the deity and we see some three-dimensional manifestation of God. But some devotees, high devotees, they see that this deity is alive. Like Prabhupada, I remember there was one situation when he was on the planet that he went to one temple, I don't know the temple, and he ate darshan and he came, he called the pujari after that. He said, the deities are complaining that the food is too blunt. And uh, so Prabhupada, he, for him, this is Krishna. For us, it is still a concept. It's still a concept. Gradually, as we advance in Krishna consciousness, Adho Shraddha, and then by Sadhu Sangha, by associating with the world, and Bhajana Kriya, by Bhajan and by Kriya, spiritual activities, and from there to Anatta Nivriti, Syat. So there we go to Anatta Nivriti. And then gradually, Ruchi, etc., and we come all the way from there, Ruchi, to uh, ultimately uh, Bhava, and ultimately Prema. That's a long way. That's a long way to come to the point of revelation that Krishna reveals himself. He can reveal himself in a minute to us. But uh, we have to be qualified. Sometimes devotees have experiences. I give an example. There was a devotee in uh, our temple in Frankfurt. He was an Indian boy. I think his name was Tulsidas. He came from uh, Hyderabad. And he told me a story that uh, one time uh, his grandfather, he was a cloth merchant, 
And he took a caravan to some other town. I think it was Hyderabad. And uh, with many camels, and they were attacked by dacoits. Everybody knows dacoits. Gundas, robbers. And uh, this man, in his anxiety, he prayed. His men were chased, somebody's arm was cut off, and somebody died, and they came to him, and he prayed, oh, Krishna, please save me. When there was a noise, and uh, a rider on a horse came, and uh, uh, a beautiful man, very young, very strong, and he chased all these robbers away, just slaughtering them, practically speaking. So when he came to this man, the man was lying on the ground, and said, he said, oh, Krishna, thank you very much. You have saved me. And uh, the, the fellow on the, on the horse smiled. And this man pulled off his finger the, the ring of his great, 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 great grandfather, you know, kind of the family ring. And he gave it to this man and he took it and rode away. So the man was completely shocked that Krishna is so kind that he comes to deliver me in this way, in this form of this horseman. When he came back to, Haida, uh, to um, uh, Chennai, he was from Chennai, right? He threw himself in, he had a little deity at home, Krishna deity, so he threw himself in front of the deity in his home and said, thank you, Lord, and he cried that you have saved me from this calamity. Then he stood up and paid his pranams and then he looked at the deity and he saw that the deity had the ring of his family on his finger. So sometimes Krishna is like that. When it comes to the brink, and some, especially when it comes to the brink, then Krishna reveals himself in some way or another, if we are fortunate. You know, he can come, he can do amazing things. I, I told the story the other day uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Bhagavatam class in the uh, Prabhupada's house that there was an instant, an instant that I myself had some little experience, not just a little experience, that was really something, that um, there was a devotee who joined us, and uh, then he went away, he was from Northern Ireland, and the priest called me up and said, you have to see this man, the, his, the uncle is there, of this boy, he wants to talk to you. I said, well, I'm not gonna see any uncles. He said, you have to, he's a very powerful man. If you don't, you're in trouble. So, um, okay, I went. There was this man sitting, with a head like a bull, you know, very red face, and, and he said to me, I want to not argue with you religion. I want you to tell this James to go back to his mother, never go back to the temple. And I said, well, James, how old are you? He said, 26. I said, 26 years old, boy, he should make up his own mind. Neither I should tell him, nor you should tell him. He shouldn't choose. He's old enough, he's not a child. No, I'm telling you, you have some power over him. Please tell him to go back to his mother. I said, never. That's unethical. If he wants to come to Krishna, who am I to say not? And if he doesn't want to go to Krishna, who am I to say he should not? If Krishna is not enforcing his uh, association on anybody, you can choose. There's no, no force on the soul. And uh, uh, because it's based on love, the relationship, you can't force love. And uh, I said, I, I won't do that, it would be unethical. I'm telling you for the last time. He became so angry and he put his finger right in front of my nose. This is like this, you know, I said, man, are you, are you threatening me? He said, yes. He said, I'm threatening you. And I'm telling you, I count up to three. And you better tell him. One, two, three, tell him. And I said, over my dead body. You, over your dead body, you said it. Over your dead body. You said it yourself, that will happen. And he ran out of the door, slammed the door. The priest was shocked. He said, do you know who that was? I said, no, no idea. He said he was a head general of the Protestant underground terrorist army, <laughs> the UDA. He said, what you did there, nobody of us Catholics would even dare to do. He said, you're dead, run for your life. Don't go to the temple. He said, immediately go to the plane, to the airplane. I was in Dublin, Ireland, 
He said, immediately go to, not Germany, where my body is from, he knows that. You have to go to Uganda, you have to go to China, you have to go to the Philippines, any remote place in, uh, to the, to the uh, Seychelles or the Adaman Eye, something like that. Otherwise he will be after you and after you and after you. This man has 60,000 people under him armed to the teeth, to the teeth, with bombs, with uh, uh, bazookies, with uh, machine guns, with any weapon you, you can think of. He said, you're dead, run. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I'm preaching in this country already since 12 years and we established some temples there and even Radha Govinda came and, and uh, I said, I'm not going to move anywhere. He said, he's going to kill you. He said, well, Krishna gave me some intelligence. All of a sudden I said, frankly, he cannot kill me. It's not in his power. Not in his power. He said, if I'm supposed to die, I will die. Either in his hands or I will fall from a chair and I'm dead, have a heart attack or I will do a car accident. It is not in his power. So the priest said, how can you have so much faith in God? He said, Father, that's what it's about, isn't it? And you don't have that faith. He agreed. He said, well, I would run. I said, I know that. That's why I joined the Hare Krishna movement. <laughs> so <laughs> I, went, I went home. Not more than one hour after that, I arrived. The priest was on the telephone. He said, oh, God, priest, do you have you? He said, heard the news. I said, no. He said, that man, he went to his car, he turned the key and a bomb took him away. He was killed within seconds. So uh, uh, this is a personal experience. If you put your life on the line, then Krishna, to that degree, Krishna reveals himself. Like this man, his life was on the line. And he prayed to Krishna, Krishna came. Ajamil, his life was on the line. Krishna came in front, sending the, the Vishnu Dutas. So Krishna is a reality. It's a, the epitome of reality is Krishna. He maintain, he is present in this world like the weave in the, in the, in the piece of cloth, the weave and the warp, I think. Weave and the, or the web and the warp. One is horizontal, one is vertical. There's a verse in Bhagavatam like this. He's everywhere. He's, he's in everyone's heart, he's in every atom. Anantarastapanam anu shayantarastam. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, and he is uh, all knowledgeable. He knows everything. So I, I remember there was a situation on the um, World Parliament of Religion in the year 2004, I went in Barcelona. And there was a discussion uh, uh, that God cannot be conceived by a human being. There was a Christian there, there was a Muslim there, there was a Jewish rabbi there, and there was a Hindu there. And they all agreed, yes, Christian, probably the Hindu was a Mayavadi, that no one can perceive God as he is. And I argued that. I said, look, you know, I mean, uh, it may be that uh, you're right in generally, and if you have a religion that is uh, catering to the general people, yes, no, no doubt, you have to be qualified. You know, like Krishna says, only by undivided devotion can I be seen as I am. But when Krishna wants to, he can just like he gave Arjuna, now I give you divine eyes. And then he saw the universal form. Krishna can do this at any time. They didn't agree. They didn't agree. No, 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 God cannot be seen. And so I went, the most intelligent of the three, or the four, a Muslim, a Christian, a Hindu, and a, a Jewish rabbi. The Jewish rabbi was the most intelligent. I could understand uh, uh, the way how he was arguing. So I went to him and said, look, um, God is, all potent. He said, can do anything. Do you agree? He said, yes. He said, why do you say God cannot reveal himself? And if he cannot reveal himself, he's not omnipotent. You limit God. With this understanding, you're actually limiting God, that he cannot reveal himself. 
Well, why do you say that? In our scriptures, Krishna says, he reveals himself in so many ways. He reveals himself to Arjuna, he reveals himself to so many saints like Uddhava. He reveals himself not so easily. I mean, I heard uh, somebody Prabhupada said that when Krishna was on the battlefield, or even entire Krishna Leela, sorry, <coughs> in entire Krishna Leela, only 100 people, about 100 people understood that Krishna was Krishna, that he was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So even some devotees, they thought, well, he's a, many, he's a great personality, he's, but that he's a Supreme, he's Vishnu even, people understood somebody, that he's Krishna, the Sumum Banum, the Sarva Karana Karana, only a hundred people understood. That's very rare. So therefore, what people do know about God? What people do know about God? I remember I went into a church in Sofia, in Bulgaria, and there was a huge, in the apsis, it means, if you look towards the altar, this is part is called the apsis of the, the church. There was a gigantic mosaic, mosaic, you know, like in Italy, the mosaic. And there was Krishna sitting with an enormous beard on his lap, God, with an enormous beard. And we know Krishna has no beard, except in one case. What's that case? Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya has a beard. So, but in general, Krishna has no beard. Navayonam Cha, he's always young. And so he, he was sitting there, Jesus was sitting on a lap. And I explained, I said, this man who painted this picture is not very knowledgeable. And when I came out of the church, I bought a postcard. And it says, I cannot lie in front of the deity, that this poster, this, this huge mosaic is made by Professor Meat Eater. It said Professor Meat Eater. And it's clear that Professor Meat Eater cannot understand Krishna. No doubt. It's no Yesam Twanta Katam Papam Jananam Punya Karmanam. There's no question that you can understand God if you're full of sin. And meat eating is the most, the most abominable thing, particularly cow killing, which is very en vogue in, uh, uh, in Western religiosity, even in Buddhism. I mean, uh, some Buddhists, even the top Buddhists of the Tibetan community, is eating meat. Yet he is Buddha Avalokiteshvara, the 14th incarnation of the Buddha of Mercy. How, how do we put this together? When he was asked, he said, well, health reason, my doctor told me. But I mean, for health, you want to murder some animal? And Prabhupada said, we can eat dogs, he said. If there's nothing else to eat, you can eat a dog. So there's hope for us, <laughs> if it comes to the worst. There's still plenty of dogs running around. But then we asked Prabhupada, would you eat a dog? He said, I'd rather die. I'd rather die. You know, so Prabhupada, he was completely pucker. He was completely perfect on every level. And he wouldn't uh, entertain the idea of uh, eating an animal. You have to be born in, in a tamasic religion. In tamasic religion, you have all kinds of ideas for who God is. You give God any name. You think God is an old man? Like, what is the most famous picture in the world of God? Who knows that? Aside from India. Huh? Michelangelo's. Michelangelo's picture in the Sistinian Chapel. There's a God, bare breasts, surrounded by a lot of naked young boys, which we know Krishna is not associated with naked boys. Michelangelo, maybe. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he's reaching out to Adam. But that's not God. That's an idea, that's a fiction, that according to one's imagination. And uh, if, you, if you see this in uh, Bhagavad Gita, I talked about it the other day also, that, um, you have a Bhagavad Gita here? There is I may have it, I mean, it's right here. Arjuna inquired, it's in the 17th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, verse number one. 
Die Shastra wie die Mutsvija, ja Tanti Shradayan, wie Tahati, Shamnistatu, Ka, Krishna, Sattvam, Aho, Rajasthamaha. O Krishna, what is the situation of those who do not follow the principles of Scripture? Here you have it. Those who do not follow the principles of Scripture. What is their position? But worship according to their own imagination. That's there. This is going on in the time of Krishna. The people were worshipping according to their own imagination. I mean, take Christianity. How many different types of Christianity there are? More than 6,000. Everybody has his own Jesus, practically speaking. You know, there are thousands and thousands that are contradicting each other, excluding each other, harassing each other, killing each other. I mean, in, uh, in the 11th century, then uh, th there was a group of Christians who were very pious. They were called the Qatars. They believed A in the soul as being our real identity. They believed that the soul is going from one body to another. And they were vegetarians. And they were preaching beautifully. So much that the whole population of the uh, Ariège, that's the area of France and Pyrenees, they accepted them. And the church became very upset. So they started a crusade. The first crusade was against the Qatars. And uh, uh, they were all murdered. There was one situation. There was one town which is called Bizier in South France. And it was surrounded by, papal, by the papal army by the, that came from Rome. And they were about to incinerate the city. So one German monk, his name was Benno. It's in the 11th century. It's all is written down. He threw himself in front of the feet of this man, the general, and said, you're, you're, uh, you're Holiness. There are only three, four Catholics in this town. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. There are only three, four Qatars in this town. Because these people in the town, they protected these people. They said, these are very saintly people. We're not handing them out. They deserve better. They deserve to live. They're more holy than all of us. So he said, all right, give them out or we kill you. So this monk, monk bowed down and said, Lord, do you realize that 99.99% of the city inhabitants are Catholics? And the answer was, kill them all. Let God make a difference. Let God make a difference who's a Catholic and who's a Protestant. And so 27,000 Catholics went up in flames, burned by Catholics. Think about that. What to speak of the Holocaust all over the world over the so many years in the name of Jesus, in the name of Allah, in the name... I mean, it is just incredible how much violence has been caused by religious... You can't, you can't really call it religion because religion means that what connects a person to God, religara. It's a very good word, actually. Religara, not only that, not only connects, reconnects which implies that we were connected to God previously. You know, reconnect, religion, religar. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, in the, uh, is it religion? Well, if it's religion, anything is religion, if the goal of life is to achieve love of God. Religion means to achieve love of God. That's the idea, because that's a methodology. We want to come to God, we have to achieve love of God, and we know it's a long process from Adosh Radha all the way to Prema. It's a scientific way given by Lord Chaitanya to Rupa Goswami at uh, Ashwamedha Ghat, uh, who was then writing the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the scientific way how to achieve, how to come to love of God. Going through the different steps, Adur, Shadar, Tata, Sadhu, Sangha, etc., Bhajana, Kriya, and, and so on. There has to be Bhajana, Kriya. Unless there's Bhajana, Kriya, uh, that's where the train stops. There's no, no revelation possible. God doesn't reveal himself. So, um, uh, the point is that, um, that the, uh, so, in the name of religion, religion, the most abominable things were done on this planet. It's not religion, it's religious imperialism, actually. In the name of Allah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of this, in the name of that. 
it's ultimately, if you analyze it, it has to do with money and power. Religion becomes deteriorated by these two things, money and power. These are the two things. It destroys everything. Because money and power, this is Kali. This is Kali. Kali took shelter wherever there was money, wherever there was gold. You know? So we have to discriminate between... It is not that in Christian religion or Jewish religion, there are no saintly people. There are also saintly people. But there are a lot of people who are not that saintly. And uh, uh, particularly when this element comes in, instead of religion being the goal of life, what, where are we, time-wise? Five minutes. Religion being the goal of life, Nata Vidu Svatagatim Vishnu, that God is the goal of life, then people think worldly religiosity is the goal of life. But it's actually only religious imperialism. It's something else. It appears right, like religion. So, uh, 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 what is religion? We have to learn from Krishna himself. And if we don't, then we end up in speculation, like in this uh, verse we just had, that Arjuna, Krishna asks, uh, Arjuna asks Krishna, what is the situation of those who worship God according to his own imagination? And the, uh, the answer of Krishna says, is, is according to the existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. So according to the mode of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. But that's not Sanatana Dharma. You don't evolve to Sanatana Dharma, except through the process of hearing, chanting, etc. You know, so, so Sanatana Dharma is uh, uh, not based on speculation. And there are so many speculations about God that uh, the most famous verse in this regard, or my favorite verse also, is uh, uh, given by, uh, let me just look it up here. <coughs> in this verse, I uh, hope, uh, there we are. Give me a moment. Sri Chaitanya Prabhu Vande. Who knows this verse? This is a verse we have to study. From Adi Lila 2 1. Sri Chaitanya Prabhu Vande. Bato piyat anugrahat. Tara nana matagraha. Vyaptam siddhanta sagaram. I offer my respectful obeisance to Sri Chaitanya Prabhu. By whose mercy even an ignorant child can cross, can swim across the ocean of conclusions about the absolute truth. It's an ocean of conclusions. My idea of God, in my opinion, God, and it's an ocean of theories, like it says here. An ocean of conclusions about the absolute truth, which is full of the crocodiles of the various theories. And it's true. I mean, think about it. You know, I, I know from my family, for example, I cannot get through to my family members as far as Krishna consciousness is concerned. I never have been able to. And there's no use because I, one should not disturb the mind of the ignorant, Krishna says. But it's kind of painful to see that uh, uh, there's no way you can, well, they, well, because they're in the crocodile of theories about God. And so many people are in the mouth of the crocodile. And so this is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya that he gives us the right Siddhanta who Krishna is. And the right Siddhanta how to go to Krishna. This is the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and we are extremely fortunate that we are in this boat of Lord Chaitanya to cross across the ocean of, of theories of God to come to Paka Siddhanta. So uh, that's our, we have to be very grateful to Srila Prabhupada that he came to give us this Siddhanta. I remember the first time I saw a book about the Krishna conscious movement in a, in a shop in Paris. I saw a picture, there was Prabhupada there, it was a Krishna book. On the back side, it was in the middle of the window. On the back side was Prabhupada, 
And uh, I had already, actually I had already written, uh, read Ishupanishad the night before. I couldn't stop reading. I had to read, I read it in the whole night from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning, something I forgot. I read that Ishupanishad, I couldn't sleep. So when I came to this little shop, there was a picture of Prabhupada on the back and the front. The front it says, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And on the back there was what I thought, I said, there he is, the Prabhuda. I thought Prabhupada was spelled Prabhuda. There's a Prabhuda, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, two hours later I was in a, in a temple and three days later I, I shaved my head and I joined the Hare Krishna movement in Hamburg. So uh, this is Prabhupada's mercy. That was on the 1st of January, so I just think about 1st of January now coming up, I'm uh, 47 years in the Hare Krishna movement. Oh. By Prabhupada's mercy, not by my doing, but Prabhupada's mercy. He picked us up some or other and brought us to the divine feet of Sri Goni Thai, Sri Krishna Balaram, and Radha uh, Samasunda. And Prabhupada told us when he installed these deities back in 1975, it was, I think, isn't it? 75, he said, now you all can go to uh, Gwonitai. He didn't say you go to Krishna Balaram, he didn't say you go to Radhasham. Because they're in their Leela. But Lord Chaitanya's Leela is preaching. And he said, that's why it's kind of curious. If you look, when people stand in the deity in this room, 900 people are there, 200 people are there, one person is here. <laughs> it's actually wrong if you should all be here. Because that's where the mercy is available. You know, the mercy. Nityananda is most merciful. Or he's the incarnation of Balaram. You can pray to Balaram, this famous prayer of Balaram, Kamatsala Lakshatu Denukari Kroratsala Mandirudha Prahari Lubatsala Lakshatu Balarari Muhatsala Mamkila Agadari. That means, uh, my dear Lord Balaram, please save me from lust, anger, greed, and illusion. It's a wonderful prayer. Everybody should know this. It's a wonderful prayer you want to recite if you stand in front of Krishna Balaram. Kamatsala Lakshatu Denukari, you are the killer of Denuka. Dinuka Dimi, Dinukari, Dinuka. Krodha Salam and Dvivita Prahari. You killed Dvivita. Then, uh, what is it? Lubatsala Rakshatu. Lubatsala Rakshatu Dinukari. Lubatsala. Lubatsala. Dvivita, Dvivita Prahari. Mohatsala, Lubatsala. Dvivita Prahari, Lubatsala. And you killed. In the form of Krishna, you killed the king of Madhava, Madhaga, which is uh, Chichupal. So I thank you so much. Do we have any? We are already out of time. Can we have one question? Or right. <laughs> just, just kidding. What did you say? Uh, so uh, for me, it's no. We, we can give people a book that we can do. It's very non-violent. But when he doesn't take the book, don't become angry if he doesn't understand. Like for example, I met when I, when I was distributing books, I met a Christian. And uh, I, I told him, I challenged him, he said, you don't know God. And he said, well, you know God. I said, yes, I know even how he looks. He said, well, show me. So I had a Bhagavatam there and I opened 
and the page opened, it was High Agree with the Horse, incarnation of Krishna. <laughs> I said, here he is. <laughs> he ran for his life. He, uh, he experienced the shock of his life. He saw God for the first time in the form of a horse. <laughs> Krishna can take any form he likes. Kesha Madrita, with the Kurma Sarira, you know, uh, in the form of a fish, in the form of a boar, in the form, even in the form of a hog, you can take anything. He's free to do anything he wants. He can appear anywhere he wants. He can turn matter into spirit. He can turn spirit into matter. He can appear in everyone's heart. He's in every atom. He's everywhere. Nothing. You cannot even lift your hand without Krishna. You cannot see without Krishna. You cannot think without Krishna. Impossible. You cannot even lift your hand and scratch your head without Krishna. No way. Because there is no connection between the body and the soul except consciousness. There is no direct connection that the soul... Say for example, I have an itch right here on the head, which is true. And I, the soul, in this body, can feel this itch because the soul penetrates the body with consciousness. Okay, but that's all. So how do I get my hand from here to there? How do we do it? Well, man proposes, God disposes. Krishna understands that he wants to scratch his head. So he calls, hello, this is Krishna. He talks to demigods. Could you please lift his hand? And the hand goes... Tch, 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 tch. <laughs> we are not the doer. We are not the driver of the car. You're just a passenger, you know? Man, we are not the karta. We are the karta in that sense, a doer, that we desire. Nityu nityananam chetana chetananam, that verse that Krishna fulfilled the desires of every living being. And so I scratch myself right here, my body. But this is only possible by Krishna in between the actual action and my desire. Krishna is not possible to do this without the super soul. Think about it, every movement we make, is facilitated by the super soul. Krishna is very busy. In every living entity, in every planet, in every universe, in millions of universes. A Krishna, I can maybe associate with one person with two or three, maybe ten, at the same time. I may look at somebody, think of somebody else, and, and uh, uh, talk about some, somebody else. That's possible. But that person who associates with unlimited living beings at every moment, that's Krishna. That's Krishna. The only Krishna can do that. And he associates with every living being at every second. It always was like this, it always is, it always will be. That's Krishna. Krishna is not so, so small as some old man who's a bookkeeper. Oh, you've done this, I saw that, okay. I've done this, uh, you, I get back to you, just wait. Krishna is not a bookkeeper. Yamaraj is doing this. So he is unlimitedly powerful, unlimitedly beautiful. He has, he has 64 qualities, one of them being that he's shy. We think big men are proud. That's not a big man. Big man, the biggest man is shy. Krishna can be very shy also. He is chivalrous, he can be most, most powerful. So many of these 64 qualities of Krishna, I was reading the other day, the most divine. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jaya, Hare Krishna.